Peter, so you're um, you're a human geographer. I'm a human geographer. Yes. Mm. What is that? What is a human geographer? What does a human geographer do? Well, um, geograph- geographers are interested in space and human interactions in space. Um, it's, it's the bridging discipline um, between the, the social sciences and the hard sciences. So we marry the two up together. Right, yeah, so E.O. Wilson would love you so, I would imagine. And well, he was a, bot- a botanist, wasn't he? Well, no, he, he was an insect person. Sociobiologist, I think, oh, would be he? his... Yeah, he's an insect person, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, I think that's his, uh, his argument in Concilius. That was, you know, his, well, his goal is to try and unite the, the, the hard sciences, as they're called, and the soft sciences. Yeah. Um, no, I, I take great offence being... You know, put together with E.O. Wilson, he's my um, mm. my nemesis. Go on, how come? Well, the half Earth idea, right, is 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 a, is just a nightmare waiting for happen. So, what is he proposing? Was it? I know we're slightly digressing before we begin, well, it's, but it's not what he's proposing; it's mm. what he's already set in motion. Um, so he he wrote a book, um, half Earth, yeah. where he recent book, isn't it? It's fairly recent. That's what. 2015, 2016. Um, so the book proposes that the only way that we can prevent the massive die-off of biodiversity is to give half of the earth over to nature and let the raging juggernaut of humanity have the, the other half. Um, obviously, you know, that sounds like a wonderful thing, a very noble effort, but when you think about it, who gets, who gets to live in the other half and who gets to stay put? Yeah, I mean, it sounds a bit somewhat yeah. utopian Dystopian. or dystopian. Yeah, because yeah. it's in some sense he's uh, he's he's arguing that we're going to have to. Well, I, that wouldn't require a whole pile of migration of human populations, or would it? Maybe it wouldn't. I think we're seeing it already. Mm. I mean, the the IUCN targets are currently set at thirty percent of space dedicated to nature. And those targets are probably likely to increase until E.O. Wilson will be cheering along as we reach the 50% half Earth finish line. And what we see is the, the UK government bringing in the Blue Belt um, strategy, which is setting aside, well, now 49% of our territorial waters for marine conservation. So, that, I mean, this this is no longer a crazy radical idea. This is the... So you think it's starting to seep into sort of to policy and, well, uh, political practice and sort of the ideology of activism and so on? Yeah, I mean, what I think we're seeing it already, not not just in policy, but actually the, 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 we're seeing these borders being put up already, these barriers um, around the British overseas territories, for example. That's all ticking along now so yeah anyway let, we'll try and keep this as you know sort of jovial and happy as possible I won't just sink everything into a dystopic kind of nightmarish scene right so let's talk about uh, Bitcoin then <laughs> yeah that's, that's not apocalyptic at all <laughs> yeah, so uh, yeah with, I suppose what would do the digression with uh, Wilson is the idea that you're, you're a human geographer and sort of you you said that you're you, you want to sort of unite the sort of the social sciences with the sort of the empirical sciences, right? Um, so you're like you're, you're kind of I guess it's an interdisciplinary uh, method. You're drawing from like sociology and anthropology, and also from well, what well, what's traditionally been known as geography. Is that right? Well, that's that's where I am specifically in my job here as a, a lecturer in international development. International development is an inherently Interdisciplinary, yeah. Even transdisciplinary discipline. What's the difference? Between human geography and... No inter and trans. Oh, <laughs> don't, don't get me started. Um, I guess it, the with human geography is all about changing mm. humans just moving through space chaotically, mm. trying to make sense of that. Um, development is sort of trying to say that hu- human development is teleological um, so that we are getting better as a species 
Um, I don't know if I share that perspective really. A bit more pessimistic. A bit more gloomy. Than that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so what I'm interested in then is why you think that sort of human geography is useful to talk about the, the blockchain. So that's what I want to sort of get to, to, to discuss with you today, sort of use your expertise to talk about the human geography of, well, not necessarily Bitcoin, but blockchain and cryptocurrency. Mm. All right. So you wrote in uh, that sort of the article, um, which was in uh, uh, Nature. Yeah. You're, well, well, let's actually start before that. Let's start before the articles. Let's start from your perspective as a human geographer. What would you say blockchain is? Mm. I think that if you can explain that to me like I'm a three year old, that would be helpful, Peter. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll just start with giving a sort of very quick introduction to blockchain, Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, and then I'll talk Terrific. about why geography is particularly useful in kind of exploring it. Um, so it's not the best way to think about blockchain, which is a technology that underpins cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, um, is to think of it like a really clumsy shared Google Doc that you're sharing with all your family and friends. Um, you've got some dodgy mates that are trying to put some weird pornography on there and you've got some other people that are just... Speak for yourself, Peter. Oh, you know, your family's like um, You've got some strange WhatsApp groups going out, yeah? Yeah, me too. So, there, so you've got other people that are trying to use it just to put on their daily transactions mm -hmm. and things that the, 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 to account for their spending. Um, and when you talk about it like that, in those terms, then you wonder why there's so much hype behind it, really. Mm. Um, because um, the real strength behind Bitcoin is not its efficiency or you know, blockchain, um, any blockchain applications. Mm. It's, it's transparency and the fact that it's, it doesn't rely on having trusted third party intermediaries. So that word transparency is interesting. If there, if there are cryptocurrencies, where does the trap in? The, where is the transparency in the crypto? If you get me. Yeah, because it's encrypted. Is that mm. what you're, that's really okay. Well, well, yeah, well, I mean, if something's encrypted, it sort of implies, well, as I understand, there's something a level of secrecy. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, so yeah. how is how is I suppose that's what people's anxiety is about. Uh, Bitcoin and blockchain is, and also why people are excited by it. Mm -hmm. You know that it's that it has this sort of very very high level cryptography attached to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you shouldn't think of a cryptocurrency as being anonymous. Mm -hmm. That's where all the criminals fall down and get arrested because uh, they think that's the case. It's pseudonymous, um, but it's quite easy to track down criminals using the blockchain. Um, because it's a chain. This <laughs> is an immutable ledger, yeah. It's, it's impossible, well, near impossible to corrupt and change. So, um, yeah, if I request some Bitcoin from you, I'd say I want 0 0.2216 Bitcoin, and then you transfer it, then all the law enforcement needs to do is to go and check the blockchain and they can match both of us together and before we know we've both got handcuffs on. Yeah. So I mean, if we want to do any dodgy stuff, buy drugs and pay for hitmen and things, probably block oh. Bitcoin isn't the way to do it. I told you I've got a weird to try and make. <laughs> <laughs> so if we yeah, so it's not all sort of. Uh, it, I mean, I do understand that, like from an everyday life sense, people think it's like it's all kind of you know the place where you go to buy guns and stuff like that, and why you know buy drugs. Well, it was the way you mm. bought... On the dark web, yeah, you know. On the silk road, yeah. that was a, but, I mean, you look at the mastermind behind the uh, the silk web. Um, Ulrich, I can't remember his surname. Ulrich someone. Um, he, that's how he was, he, he was caught. He was caught just by being careless, thinking that it was all anonymous, but it wasn't. Yeah. Um, so what is, so then Bitcoin then, is an iteration of blockchain. Would that be fair to say? Bitcoin was the first experiment in blockchain. So the like the cypherpunk movement's been going along since the eighties. The people who so 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 what is that? Peter? Cipher. The the yeah the cy cypherpunk. Ah okay sorry yeah I thought you said yeah. cyber yeah yeah yeah. So these were people that are very kind of radical libertarians, 
um, back in the 80s that were well into their cryptography and just when the internet came along their, their vision was to have the internet as being a very um, kind of open, free of government interference, um, decentralised um, way of for people to collaborate. Um, and that when the global financial crisis kicked in, um, Satoshi Nakamoto, who was the mastermind behind Bitcoin, um, does he, he exist? Wow, he's like a financial banksy, isn't he? It's, I'll tell you. Go on. It's, it's you. Sorry, I <laughs> meant to whisper that. Um, so yeah, I mean he. I'm honoured. <laughs> Um, yeah, so he'd already written a paper, um, the white paper on Bitcoin, um, which was picked up on lots of user forums uh, of this sort of cypherpunk movement thing, and then Bitcoin was born. But there's been other iterations of a decentralized um, platforms similar to Bitcoin. I mean, there's been um, the, the, the Ch Ch Chinese coin. I think it's Q coin. Oh, I've, yeah, I've heard of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah I've heard of this. Um, yeah. So there's been other attempts to try and mm. put this together. Yeah. And, and see, this, this blockchain then, it's not what interested me in sort of your article, which I'll put up on the, on the show notes. Okay. Um, blockchain technology is not uh, necessarily linked to currency. I mean, so you were saying that like it can be used in voting systems. Yeah. It can be used in, uh, in sort of government institutions, but I guess it can be used in sort of corporations. Is that right? It is. And then I think once you realise the potential applications for the technology, then you, like, if you're like me, you start thinking, oh, God, it's got to be used for this end. And I'll give you an example. So I'm buying a new house at the minute because, you know, us lecturers, we do that with our salaries. So you get a, a solicitor that emails you all the time and asking you for just a document or something for you to sign and then they'll charge you two units of time and each unit is six right. pounds or something like that. So you end up paying 15 quid in the end because you've replied to an email or something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the blockchain, it would be a fantastic way to just get rid of conveyancing altogether, just get rid of them as a profession. <laughs> <laughs> Got to think what it confers, yeah. <laughs> and um, then just use a de decentralized application to do all of that work for us. Because all a, a, a convincing solicitor is is a third, trusted third party intermediary where the transacting parties don't trust. So them. the argument then would be that you could have the blockchain performing the same service. That facilitates all of those transactions in a way that even if we don't trust each other, we yeah. can trust the information that's mm. being stored immutably on the blockchain. Oh, so and plus they make stuff up anyway, these conveyors, don't they? I mean, they, they, they make stuff up. <laughs> the blood sucking leeches. Did you get stung? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I won't tell you. Okay, what yeah. Time I use. But um, yeah, I mean, so, I mean, you could just. Um, I guess it will collate all of the documentation on the blockchain, you mm -hmm. can do it that way. But an even cleverer way to do that is to use a smart database um, like that used by the Ethereum blockchain. So what, this is, what distinguishes Ethereum then as an iteration of blockchain? Right, so you, on the Ethereum blockchain, this was the first experiment in blockchain which uses smart contract technology. Okay, so um, let's you stick with my um, example of conveyancing solicitors. Um, we could use this if this then that scenario. So uh, through our transaction we could specify rules that if I give you this amount of money and this document and this thing from the local planning body or something like that, if I collate all of these documents and they're all verified uh, then then you will give me the keys to the house that you're selling to me so you can that can all be done using self-executing codes yeah sure sure but 
I suppose your point is that you get rid of the intermediary of the, right. the conveyor. That's right. Yeah. It's only a matter of time. Yeah. I think. I mean, if you you think of that example specifically, that lends itself very well to being having a blockchain fix applied to it. Yeah. So you think it's coming this blockchain? You think it's going to be sort of become more pervasive in all aspects of human life? I think. Yeah. I, th I I think that blockchain has, has become quite loaded now, um, where people are perhaps quite critical of it because it has been overused and used in ways that potentially kind of aren't required. And I think for that reason, we might see the back end of business administration being governed using blockchain technology, but you as a consumer wouldn't even know about it. Mm. That's quite possible. Um, we're seeing different kinds of blockchain. So Bitcoin is the epitome of a kind of open, transparent, um, accessible blockchain for anyone who wants to get involved in it. If you want to start mining Bitcoin, you just download the Bitcoin Core. Um, program you can start mining and just getting involved in that economy but if you take a, an example of like the IBM food trust platform which is a closed permissioned blockchain so IBM would own what we were managing this um, application that's built on this blockchain they would only give rights of access to certain individuals and therefore, it's just it's just a network really that's, that doesn't necessarily enable everyone to get involved in it. So there's like loads of different kinds of blockchain. You shouldn't think that they are all. Yes, yeah, so it's not a homogenous phenomenon. You're uh, you're interested in this sort of application of blockchain, right? Now, the piece that you wrote tries to explain uh, some of the more positive uh, uses of, say, blockchain uh, technology, right? Now, because what's interesting to me about that is because normally when we talk about cryptocurrencies, I think there is a kind of, at least as far as I've seen, a prevailing wisdom that this is bad for the environment. As you, I think you said yourself, uh, you know, uh, the, the sort of the electricity in Bitcoin's computationally, computationally demanding infrastructure enables digital payments to be validated by means of a decentralized automated proof of work consensus protocol. And in terms of how much electricity that takes, you say somewhere between Cuba and Poland. <laughs> So we're talking about something the size of a uh, small countries, basically. Well, big countries, big actually. Poland is a big country, absolutely. Yeah. Well, my point is, how is that good for the environment? Well, the way that the mm. blockchain is growing, because the blockchain is constantly growing, so nothing's ever deleted from it. So the more information, which is, what, four megabytes every 10 minutes, is added to the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, and then you've got all the computing power that's going into actually mining the coin, which is just, you know, it makes mm. the actual data storage of the actual blockchain itself look like just nothing really. So it, it, the, it's growing all the time. The, 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 we're going to have this halving event that's going to happen in May. So yeah, halving. Okay. Okay. So the the way it works is, you, let's say you download the Bitcoin Core platform and you start mining Bitcoin. Sure. And then for by some miracle, you manage to to um, validate a block and you're rewarded by 12 and a half Bitcoin, which is what you currently get for solving this really complicated math, math puzzle, um, which enables the validation process on the Bitcoin blockchain to continue. And you will get 12 Bitcoins at the current market and rate. Half, which, and each Bitcoin is currently worth six, seven thousand pounds or something. But you're competing against like these enormous data centers. Mines are, effectively, yeah. Yeah, essentially, you know, the size of Nottingham Trent University, yeah. just full of servers and things, you know. It's not going to happen, basically. It's yeah. not going to happen on this. Yeah. No, I'm pointing at your computer, yeah. But, yeah, um, yeah, it's very small. <laughs> <laughs> but let's say you did, you win 12 and a half Bitcoins today. But in May, um, because the Bitcoin cryptocurrency is, is inherently deflationary, every time it produces 200,000 blocks, and one block is produced every 10 minutes, You the reward quantity halves. Ah, okay. Right, so after May, you only get six and a quarter Bitcoin, but the price will probably increase. So you'll have more people trying to mine the remaining amount of tokens, right? So because they're putting even more pressure on so therefore that says to me then that that's going to require more resources, more energy and more electricity to, 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 to use that. Keep the data centers cold 
And right, so you, there's there's an actual refrigeration element to this because yeah. oh, yes, yeah, cause of course computers heat and then oh. you've got computers and then massive centers, there's going to be more heating. Yeah. So then you're going to need more refrigeration. So so then if they're, say, in a place like Texas, for example, right. they're going to need even more uh, cooling. Yeah, but I mean, if air conditioning, yeah. But you, you would only put a, uh, a Bitcoin mining pool. Um, mining center close to renewable mm. energy it has to be kind of cheap residual energy because if you think about it so you would say like coal would be better than water currently or, or, or an alternative uh, renewable form of yeah i mean how how it normally works so 75 percent of the electricity used to power the bitcoin network comes from renewables and it has to be, it, i mean it is it is like that because um take coal which is where most of the power comes from in the UK, that powers our electricity use. Yeah. Um, I turn the light on, someone, I don't know, I'm not an expert, but someone down the road switches on the furnace or something, and then I get my electricity. Like, it's instantaneous. That's I great. hope you're happy. this new house you move into, <laughs> you've got to figure it out, Peter. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but go on, sorry, I'm joking, yeah, go yeah. on. But it's, um, it's a reactive thing, right? But when you got, you, we can't control the wind, we just make electricity out of wind power when it's wind when the wind is blowing, not when I want the light being switched on. Yeah. So you have a residual amount of electricity that's just wasted, oh. right? And what you could do is then hook up a Bitcoin mining data center next to that yeah. wind massive wind. Or you could sell it back to the grid. You could, sell, but that's only if people want to mm. buy it. And if if I'm trying to sell electricity in the middle of the day, which is when people generally don't use it because they're, you know, at work being whatever people do at work. Using electricity, yeah. <laughs> but actually, the, the peak load is when people get home in the evening. Right. Which is when the Bitcoin infrastructure is switched off because basically all the electricity is going into people's mm. everyday lives. Yeah. So you've got to think about the electricity that's powering the Bitcoin network would probably mm. be going to waste anyway, potentially. It's still incredibly wasteful. Bitcoin. Oh, sorry, blockchain. Bitcoin. Bitcoin specifically, um, so when I'm trying to mine Bitcoin, generally, like, sorry, but you're not going to mine any Bitcoin mm. using your laptop, you're mm -hmm. going to have to use an ASIC server, um, which is a specialist tailored piece, piece of equipment that it can only run the complicated maths puzzle to mine Bitcoin, which is called SHA-256. So it runs this algorithm in order to try and mine Bitcoin so you get the reward. Um, a SHA-256 ASIC server can only be used to mine Bitcoin. So as soon as Bitcoin, let's say it's not a thing anymore, and we go, oh, well, let's, I know, let's just abolish capitalism or this mm. any form of exchange, and let's just sort of, you know, exchange food for kisses or something like that. Which Sounds brilliant. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> then you, it's not like you can repurpose all of these ASIC servers Right. All of these data servers, so because these these tailored servers can only be used to mine Bitcoin. They would go s straight in the sea. Yeah. So so there's yeah. So the different types of cryptocurrency then that are using blockchain would have the same problem. I presume they're because they're sort of internally cryptographized, if that's a word. No, I mean yeah. this is a, this is a hardware issue. It's not software. Oh, I see. It's just yeah. these particular hardware. Yeah, yeah. and they mm. all use these um, the these. Mm. All these data centers use SHA-256 yeah. ASIC servers. So, it used to be that you could run the program just on your um, hard drive of your PC. Yeah. Then it became, so everyone was like, oh, you need a lot more power. And the most powerful chip on your computer is your graphics chip. So everyone used to mine Bitcoin using their graphics. Mm. And now even that's not powerful enough, so they have to use these ASIC servers. And the technology is going to be com evolve com constantly. Yeah, so I'm still... Right, so this idea, I mean, you mentioned it there about sort of when it came along uh, in the in the 90s or I thought it was conceived in the 90s. And it was, that was very much of that time, that, that, that thought that sort of, you know, it was the 90s, like, you know, everyone was, on, everyone was taking ecstasy and stuff like that. So everyone was going to like, uh, you know, mining Bitcoin and <laughs> going to raves. No, I think the point is that there was this sort of impulse for towards decentralization. Right? And for, yeah, liberal yeah. freedoms, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, that was right, right, right. So sort of the Fukuyama idea is working there behind that as well, that this is the end of history, like, you know, and I suppose what characterizes this in some ways, uh, it's, it's very kind of, there's something, there is something kind of paranoid about this, or maybe paranoid is too strong a word, there's a, a lack of trust in, 
the institutions that have traditionally backed money you know so like I don't know if you want to go back to the 1700s go back to the gold standard or whatever you could talk about that but the, the, the you know post sort of 2008 a lot of the enchantment with these alternative currencies emerges from sort of scepticism of one our public institutions two our government and three well banks banks are not uh, not trusted so people are going let's 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 use this stuff let's use this stuff well now that's that's I think that's that's okay that's I can understand that but this idea of decentralization decentralization does not imply placelessness does it like I mean you said you have said this like these are I've looked at pictures uh, on, on online like when I was preparing for this of these of these Bitcoin uh, factories these mines like and they are massive they're huge we like we have this impression that they're just you know so it's just like a bunch of hackers that uh, you know doing this at the weekend uh, but it's but it's not it's like massive huge sort of plants full of uh, processes and services right so that seems to me they would they would have an advantage over my laptop or the competitor down the road which you know only three factories rather than nine or whatever right so that still seems to be tied to place that's my question yeah mm. yeah absolutely yeah. i mean there's lots of ways and that's just what the geography side of it i'm interested in you sort of talking about yeah uh, the, the, this is the the one bit i guess it's like geographies are well they should be i don't think we're seeing a lot of um critical geographies getting in in this space yet but i mean it's it's that surprises me because there's interesting questions around materiality, for example, of, mm. of Bitcoin specifically, um, yeah. and I and I guess you could just apply a lot of the um, engagements with looking at cloud computing or. Um, yeah, but the internet is also in the, places, yeah. isn't it itself? You know, we think the internet is disembodied when it is in fact very much hooked up to servers and and and, 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 and you know, it's, it has a physical infrastructure. Yeah, materiality. Yeah. Um, but I mean, there's also, I think, more interesting questions around um, the spatial dimensions of, of Bitcoin blockchain specifically. I mean, if we if we look at um, a project that I'm doing at the minute is looking at crypto colonialism. Um, so I'm using the example. <laughs> Sorry, just the, the Irish man and me just with <laughs> all colonialism is crypto, Peter. <laughs> So no, specifically explain that term, thank you. Yeah, so um, I guess this term, again, it's been around a long time, but crypto colonialism um, was used as a way of framing the post-colonial era, era when um, a lot of the ex-colonies were, give, were liberated, um, but they became debt slaves in the form of structural adjustment programs. Um, so in that respect, it was sort of a crypto colonial movement, which which meant that it wasn't like a boots on the ground kind of colonialism, but it was this more kind of economic, um, yeah. like soft imperialism. Yeah, it, yeah. yeah. Of, of, a, of, a, of a sort, yeah. Of an implicit, of a, yeah, mm -hmm. a, a sort of covert kind of form of colonialism. Um, I, I guess I've changed the meaning of it. It's an interesting um, question to me. This, I think it's really interesting. It's like, as a, in what sense can these crypto cur cur currencies be deployed mm -hmm. in a sort of in a colonial sense? I mean, are they tied to countries, for example? You know, are they tied to empires? I mean, they're certainly tied to. I, that's my point about them being placeless. They're tied to very sort of. They're tied to existing patterns of resource use. That's right. right yeah. We can, let's look at Puerto Rico, for example. So um, after the big hurricane they had in Puerto Rico, um, there were lots of people that probably had very good intentions that they were going to make Puerto Rico into this sort of crypto utopia. Um, Cryptopia. Yeah, Cryptopia. That's a good, I'll use that one. I'll use, use that. And I can use that. <laughs> yeah. um, um, so this was basically the Puerto Rican government setting up tax regimes to encourage incentivize it yeah. distributed app developers to come to Puerto Rico and they can make it into this sort of hub of blockchain development okay and the fact that they use the US dollar means they could offload um, they could sell cryptocurrencies to the US without kind of the, the expensive wiring the, the expensive problem of taxation <laughs> yeah exactly so I mean that's one example how you can how just because it's distributed and decentralized it still has these big kind of spatially 
um, important implications. In terms of the implic in terms of the wielding of political power as well, like you know, I mean, so within say Puerto Rico, I presume that there would have been internal sort of political antagonisms about how they would, you know, whether they ought to or not appeal to Bitcoin users and Bitcoin developers or sort of blockchain developers in order to 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 to, 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 to attract them. Yeah, I mean, it's not, I mean, Naomi Klein has a lot to say about this. The journalist, left-wing journalist, she wrote um, on fire as a recent book, which she's written. And this changes everything. This changes yeah, everything. yeah. It's sort of two sort of big. Um, so, so, so those, disaster capitalism. Yeah, so she's kind of two key texts in the environmental movement in the past sort of five to ten years. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. Um, but I mean, she she's interested in the case of Puerto Rico and these sort of. Um, crypto utopian people that are basically buying up all of the cheap beachfront accommodation, displacing all the local people that perhaps have different kind of um, ideas. So, so crypto gentrification. Yeah. Gentrification. <laughs> I'm telling you, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I mean this is this is the Puerto Rico one is a good example. I've got paper coming out. Um, Why are you whispering? Well, just, just a little, just dropping, just the people. Um, yeah, I'll send me the link and I'll put it up in the show yeah, notes. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's specifically looking at crypto um, mm. colonialism. So from your research, Peter, do you think there are parallels can be drawn between good old-fashioned sort of, say, French-British German colonialism in the sort of say, the Victorian period and these, this, this new iteration of colonialism? That interests me. I'm just curious. Um, yeah, in, a, in 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 new, novel, innovative ways, I think. For sure. Uh, I mean, uh, if we if you look at One Coin, there's a great podcast at the minute called uh, The Missing Crypto Queen that you can listen to on. I've heard of this. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll put a link on the. Uh, uh, One Coin isn't a cryptocurrency. It's just pretending to be a cryptocurrency, and. Um, a lot of the money that's been made is, is from Ponzi schemes that have been set up in places like Uganda. So you get lots of people that probably don't understand cryptocurrencies and blockchains and technology that sort of underpins yeah. cryptocurrencies. But it's almost like, well, I understand Bitcoin. I understand that people have made a lot of money out of that. So I'm um, sure. So this, so this is sort of um, people that are going to the global south, still suffering from the scars of, you know, traditional forms of colonialism that are now being sort of swept into this other kind of giant Ponzi scheme that they don't man they can't benefit from. Mm. There's a, I think um, if we look at Jack Dorsey, who is the, the Twitter CEO. Of Twitter, yeah. Um, so he's set up a, an application called Square, which is basically just trying to, I, uh, this is the way I understand it, this is just my opinion. Um, I think it's trying to compete with platforms like M-Pesa, um, which is a, a money sending app that you can use on your mobile phone. Sure. Um, but Square accepts payments in Bitcoin, um, and Dorsey has is, is, is been very explicit that he sees Africa as being the, the, the new frontier for blockchain development. God, white men have been doing that for years, well, exactly. haven't they? <laughs> it deserves our Attention. critical engagement, especially, you know, I think geographers are already um, in the space anyway. We just need to kind of get to grips with the all the techie aspects of it that I think a lot of academics yeah. have got. Well, this, 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 uh, this, this, this interests me again because the way you've talked about it, you've explained it very well, I think, as much as you can explain this, right? You know, it seems somewhat esoteric. I guess you know something called crypto is going to be esoteric, right? But it's, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, there is a, when we talk about sort of conventional methods of exchange, right? There is a sense that you know, you know, a pound is a pound or whatever, and you can buy X amount of goods for it, right? Even like an ATM card, where we're now moving to the cashless societies, or more and more cashless societies, there is a sense that there is an X amount of money someplace. Now, I, I know money doesn't work like that, you know. I mean, that underlines the fallacy of the idea, you know, that that the, a, a government gives us a household uh, can be worked like a household budget. The government budget works the same as a household budget, right? That fallacy. But I suppose my point is, you know, 
what is the use value of this? You know, for you know, for someone who doesn't know anything about this. I mean, what you're talking about is something very, very technical, and someone who's got, who's clever and has got more technical aptitude should theoretically be able to do better with this type of currency rather than say someone who's who knows how money exchange works. Right. I mean, well, this is a, the tough bit. Um, we'll go back to my conveyancing example. Yes. Uh, I'm I'm buying a house. I'm selling a house. I don't. I'm not very good at building houses. No. I kind of know that they have walls and a roof and found foundations. Is it something like that? And then like Last I checked, yeah. like down pipes or something like that, and that holds the whole structure up. This is a, this is a fantastic little academic yeah. <laughs> jamboree. This is a like, you know. I don't know enough about the fundamentals behind what keeps a house standing upright. Yeah. But I can still or how buy, a credit card works, perhaps. Well, even. exactly. I, but I can yeah. buy and sell these things because there are a. An array of trusted intermediaries that I can hold to account. So if the whole thing falls on its head, you know there was a, a surveyor that that, that, did that can be sued. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And there's there's easy there's, kind of legal recourse for all parties if there's this. Yeah, there's government regulators in place and things like that. The whole system. Yeah. So I can get my money back when things go wrong. That's not there with 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 a lot of these um, distributed systems. So that is why people have to understand the technology. You can't really get involved in a new cryptocurrency project, for example, unless you understand the downpipes and the foundations and the roof and all and the, all the more technical stuff, what's underneath the floorboards and all of these aspects mm. of it. Because if you don't, you're just going to get swept up in a one coin Ponzi scheme and it will be your own fault because you didn't understand it. Those questions won't be put to people who you know, lost out in the global financial crisis, for example, because the system's already got an array of intermediaries mm. that are not to account with that. I guess like the, the Marxists would say, what is the use value of this thing here, of this blockchain? I mean, and you've said like that there's a variety of different uses yeah. of it, you know? But in sort of currency terms, maybe it's not as uh, dynamic as we might think it is. Okay. Yeah, I mean, Bitcoin is is a store of value and it's a means of exchange. Right. I mean, yeah, so you store money, yeah? Yeah, essentially. Like it's, your bank account, yeah. Yeah, I mean, in some respects, it has a, 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 a more believable use value than the pounds in your pocket because it's deflationary. It can't be kind of controlled by the, the, an intermediary or... Um, yeah, the government can't collapse around it theoretically. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. And as long as there's the functioning internet, then the thing lives on. Um, oh, mm, there's there, there's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, there are some um, other tokens that you can use on other blockchains that their value comes from the fact that they facilitate. Um, all the exciting things that that distributed application can do. And I use the example in that paper of a couple of these carbon trading projects where... Right, so here you're referring to, um, you talked about uh, SolarKind and Ecosphere. Yeah, Ecosphere, yeah, that's an interesting one, yeah. Yeah, so they're using uh, carbon credits uh, to intermediaries using blockchain tokens. Yeah, so for example, that's so Poseidon, um, they, if I'm not mistaken, are using the Ethereum blockchain. Um, how it works is you go into the London store of Ben and Jerry's and you buy a scoop of ice cream and that Ben and Jerry's will take a couple of pence extra on the value of this scoop if you give them the permission. They use a blockchain um, to convert that to a, a kind of a cryptocurrency token which is then sent to Cordillera Azul National Park in Peru and that token is used to reimburse farmers for planting trees. So it's kind of, it, it's used as an offset for the embodied carbon emissions that come from that scoop of ice cream, you're offsetting it by planting trees. And that sounds like a very complicated process. It's really complicated and it begs yeah. the question, why don't you just use the money to plant trees in your back garden? Or <laughs> right, like yeah, that? yeah. And this is the way the global yeah. economy works. So the global indeed, economy indeed. finds the most cost-effective solutions to problems. And if that means planting trees are hmm. the cheapest to plant, which is in Peru, hmm. rather than where land is expensive in Nottingham, hmm. then uh, let's plant them in Peru. But the value of the token itself comes from being part of this uh, network. network.
Yeah. So it's still, I'm still. Are you optimistic or pessimistic about this? Really, I mean, in the in, in the in the article, you say you're optimistic. Or I, I I just in an intuitive sort of idiot, you know, philosophy of everyday life. Since like uh, you know, you as I said, talk to me like I'm a three year old on this because this is not going to disrupt existing patterns of consumption. In fact, if anything, it's going to amplify them, which in turn will be bad for the environment. Now. I, I, I presume you can use, all, you know, these, these, these factories can use like alternative sources when they become very, very efficient. Yeah. yeah. So uh, what, what do you think? Are you optimistic or pessimistic on this? Uh, do, you, do you share my gloom? I don't know. I'm kind of optimistic. Oh, good. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm like you, I think, you know, I think the, if, if you're not smashing shit up, you're wasting my time sort of thing, you know, get rid of capitalism. Mm. Um, how, and, and I think a lot of these projects um, kind of, they, um, how have I, how have I, how was good? Like, they reproduce capitalist forms of class power, definitely. Oh, so there's a replication, you think, Peter, of hierarchy in some of these internal economies and if you take for example the coronavirus in China um, what we see is a massive spike in the price of Bitcoin around the outbreak of, of the coronavirus well, because and a lot of it is mined in China Bitcoin, yeah. this, but that's not the only reason yeah. I mean if you're in a country where that has tight fiscal controls especially on capital flight outside of the country it, the only way that you can get take money out of China quickly, a lot of money is using Bitcoin. And this is why Bitcoin price goes up because everyone wants it. Everybody wants it. Just, they need to get out quick, you know, need to move. Um, and in that respect, it's sort of like, you, you'd you have a very, what's the word, kind of um, or, orchestrated kind of um, fiat mm. based economy that has tight controls from the government and Bitcoin kind of enables a more kind of free global economy, which is the epitome of neoliberalism really, isn't it? To remove all of those barriers that governments try and put up for capital. And it's what, well, what's the alternative then? Is the alternative then just protectionism? You know, <laughs> I mean, that's, I suppose that's what a lot of the political configurations that we've seen emerge in the past couple of years, sort of Trump ran on a sort of an isolationist thing, Brexit was a sort of a, a, pro a protectionist, uh, Project right, and if the and if you know the primary role of the state is to facilitate the free market, and then what are we going to do? What in trust, you know, or give trust to that you know, government and that form of regulation? Probably that well, I I trust people in my network more, you know, and and I think um, Bitcoin. I see, I see, yeah. So you, you, respect, yeah. yeah, so you trust uh, your, your your mates on WhatsApp. I trust the information on the blockchain, the Bitcoin blockchain, for example. More than, More than yeah. Donald Trump and, and uh, whoever's in charge of whatever charge, national. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's where that's where the that's where the optimism lies. That it's sort of hopefully this can cultivate new networks of trust and. Uh, I think we need to remain very vigilant. Um, I mean, again, I mean, if we look at Chile, um, the big rights in Santiago. Um, and again, we see a spike in Bitcoin price and lots of Bitcoin take up in these localities during these times of civil unrest. Um, but all that all we're really seeing then, if you look at that, is that Bitcoin enables capitalism to carry on unabated. So you don't that the the civil unrest doesn't cause a disruption for the economy. I suppose it would be even an intensification of uh, capitalism because it's it's you know you don't really need a government to guarantee anything more. It's a sort of well you said it libertarian. There's an absolute lack of um, regulation, and you have a sort of an unfettered free market. Yeah, I mean there's some horror, real horror stories with this technology as well. There's um, um, a a coin called Repo Coin. Um, I can't remember if I suppose we talked about this in the article, but um, so the way it works in the UK, um, if you hire, a, well, you buy a car, but you do it on higher purchase, then you have to pay instalments to, until you own the car. Yeah, um, and while the car is depreciating in value. Well, yeah. yeah, I mean, and if I don't make a repayment on time, then that, the hire company or the car, whatever, whoever sold me the car, they have to go to the court 
to get a CCJ issued against me so they can get the money back or the car repossessed or something like that. In America, it's different. In America, the hire of the company that sold me the car gets a copy of the key and they only relinquish that copy of the key once it's all paid off. Um, the only problem is, is that they have no way of locating where my car is if I stop making payments. So they've set up this system called RepoCoin and how it works is that if I believe as a normal citizen that someone owns a car and they're not making regular repayments on it, I, get, I download the RepoCoin app, I take a photo of the number plate in whatever location the car's in and I'm rewarded with RepoCoin which I can then use to buy, or not to, but it's a reward program so I can get cinema tickets or something like that in exchange for repo mm. coin. But obviously what happened was is that you just get loads of rich tech savvy white kids that go into poor predominantly black neighbourhoods taking photos of these expensive cars only for them to lose their car and it get repossessed while, you know, the rich... So the system is open to fraud and manipulation? Well, that's not manipulation, that's no. just how the system is meant to run. But right. <laughs> it, but it reifies all of these kind of inherent, you know, uh, bias and bigotry that comes within our society. I mean, just because it's high tech and it's all on the blockchain, it doesn't kind of absolve us of any of those... I mean, political problems. responsibility, yeah. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Okay, I think you need to go to a meeting now. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah.